How you guys been going? Yeah, uh, we're good, thank you. Oh, good? He's, um, yeah, when they get to 18 months, they're so active. Like, he can run off now and, <laughs> yeah, he's a cheeky little one, but so much fun. I did the, um, it's so funny, Jess. I was the, I, I guess, it, do you call it the commentator? I was the MC at the yeah. Great Ocean Road Race the other day. And I was standing on the start line talking to a bloke there, and he's like, oh, my wife's running. And he had an 18-month-old in the um, in the pram. And he's like, mate, I love my kid. He goes, but about this age, they can turn into little assholes. <laughs> he goes, he's learned how to have a hissy fit. Yeah. He even goes, no, 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 no. <laughs> he's so cute. Every time I, every time I see a photo of him, I'm, uh, I'm like, man, it's so funny to see what Charlie's going to look like a little bit down the track in terms of size. Because I, I feel like, how old's Billy? Like, nearly, he'd be pushing... Yeah, no, he's coming up to 19 months now. Oh, no, okay. I was going to say push... Yeah, I guess. I was going to say pushing too, but still a few months off. But um, he looks like a giant compared to my little mate. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Hey, um, Jess, how, how long have you got? Because uh, I'll just talk to you for... Like, I won't talk forever, but if you've got to go in half an hour or, or whatever, you just let me know. I'm just going to do an elliptical session after this and then I'll go and pick up Billy from childcare. So. Oh, sweet. All right. No, nah, no worries. Let's do that then. Oi, I, I put out a, a, a one of the benefits of, uh, of having a little bit of trouble lining up a time to do this with you is I, I put out another post last night just saying send some questions through. So as long as I can figure out how to access Instagram, I always get so confused with... Um, with how to check like questions that people have with those boxes and Jesse's not in the house at the moment so you could be seeing my Instagram skills come into play which is a messages maybe yeah um what is it I got it I actually noticed oh here we go I've just checked a couple of notifications for anyone who has sent questions through if I don't ask them today I'm so sorry I um I think I've taken a couple of screenshots from a couple of weeks ago when we put that post out as well just so I don't lose those but we'll see how we go but essentially I um I was on a walk a couple of, it was probably like a month ago now, I was on a walk in Melbourne and a few runners come past and they were just talking about the marathon and uh, I was like, oh, it'd be so good just to be able to put out like a, a few more dedicated marathon specific conversations because it, I, honestly, I reckon like from any question that comes through, whenever I put out the question like, all right, what do we need to talk about more? Marathon just gets mentioned over and over again and I'm lucky enough to have you as a mate. So I thought, okay, well, why not? Like rather than just go to uh, uh, Mr. Coach Pops, we'll get someone who's actually a, an elite level marathon runner, not just someone who talks a lot about it. <laughs> so I thought... I'll... It's relevant at the moment with um, the Gold Coast Marathon and when other marathons coming up. I mean, everyone's been so starved of official marathon opportunities. Everyone could sort of go out and do it around their um, suburb you know, if they wanted to during COVID when there wasn't a, a time restriction to the training. But it's not quite the same as towing the line with, you know, thousands of others and, and actually getting in a race. So it's really exciting that we've got that, that opportunity this year. Oh, it's so nice. Actually, yeah, just standing on that start line, at, um, I was in Lawn for, to, to kickstart that race the other day. And uh, man, the I, I seriously could feel the buzz. Like I don't know if it had just been a long time since I'd been back to a race, and I forgot how excited they were, like or how much excitement was in the air at a race like that. But but standing there, I was thinking, oh my gosh, like these these people were ready to go. I asked the question, I go, all right, let's just get a bit of a gauge of the emotions in the uh, in the start, like in the starters. What do you call it in the field right now? I said, oh, who's nervous? And about four people out of about five thousand put their hand up. And I was like, oh gee, that's not a good start. I said, who's excited? And uh, everyone, everyone let out like this big roar. And I was like, oh, okay, excitement wins. <laughs> it's uh, yeah, it's crazy. You're right because I spoke to people last year who um, they, they were training for Melbourne specifically, and they're like, all right, well, if Melbourne doesn't go ahead, I'm running a marathon on that date, no matter what. We're just going to make it happen. So, yeah, you're so right though. Like the excitement that comes with running actual big field marathon is uh, is it's a whole different ball game to to just what going out and running 25 laps of your suburb. <laughs> yeah, and I think these marathon events are you know, a key motivator for people to exercise and get fit. You know, some people find it really, you know, hard to to find that motivation to get out the door when you've got so many other commitments sort of <laughs> um, at home. But when you've got, when you've actually signed up to a race and you feel like you're being held accountable, it can uh, be the perfect motivator. 
Yeah, no, it's so true. It's so true. So, hey, with all that said, I'm going to fire. Just, I've got a few of my own questions that I've got written down that I, I thought might be helpful for people to know. If there's anything that I've completely missed um, or forgotten to ask that you think would be relevant, feel free just to to bring it up and go for it, and we'll talk about that as well. I guess it's uh, like me and you have been in the sport for so long now, what, me probably 20 years, and I'm sure you're probably around about the same, that it amazes me that I still have like a heap of questions around. There's just endless ways to train and to recover cover and to race and like what you should wear and why you should wear it and blah, blah. it just goes on forever so i'm sure we could this could be like a 25 part podcast series <laughs> well it is constantly evolving too isn't it i mean if we had this chat five years ago there wouldn't have been the same shoe ranges available um nutrition's evolving training methods are evolving um and that's one thing i always you know think back to the fact that the Olympics, um, they didn't even have a women's marathon until 1984. Like, it's actually quite a young sport at that level. So it's um, not surprising that training methods uh, for women in particular have been evolving rapidly. Yeah, it's so true. Actually, I was trying to be the wingman for you and, uh, oh, my gosh, I've completely blanked on her name and she's an absolute legend. What's the New Zealand girl we went to Canada with? Oh, Lydia O'Donnell. Oh, Lydia, Lydia, because she was getting into the um that training specifically for, like for women, like dealing yeah. with their uh, menstrual cycle and stuff like that. I thought, okay, this is a field that I just don't understand, but it's so it, like it is interesting. I can imagine that'd be a massive question. I always tease, I always tease my Jesse because I'm like, oh babe, like you're not going to keep up today. I'm going to have to edit this part out of the podcast because I just sound like an asshole. But um. <laughs> Especially at the moment. Now that um, I can't tease her anymore because she's bloody just she's given birth to a kid and she's still trying to find her feet after that. She's uh, her six pack is looking good, but her, her running hasn't quite taken off um, like it had before the uh, before before she gave birth to little mate. So I need to line up a conversation with you two so she can get all inspired. Well, even Adam, my coach, has told me that um, my biomechanics and my posture is a bit different since giving birth. He's not saying it in a critical way it's just an observation and something that I need to take into account when I'm you know since I've got back into training and um, trying to reduce my injury risk because I had you know lost a little bit of that control of my pelvis um, and sort of that lower spine area because of my abs being affected so yeah, it's yeah. an interesting space. <laughs> I, should, I probably should clarify that uh, whenever I tease Jessie about it, it's purely teasing. It's something we're laughing about. I'm not just being an asshole. Um, she, I promise you if she heard that, she would laugh or at least chuckle. So for anyone out there who was like, oh, wow, I would have picked Tice to be a good husband. I promise I am. <laughs> That's the problem with these things. You can't. Um, I'm I'm lazy when it comes to editing. Uh, well, unless I need to be like our last podcast. Let, let, unless I need to be a star. But I'm very lazy when it comes to editing. So I'm like, all right, I'm just going to let that fly, and we'll just I'll see if I can get away with it. So I reckon. Can we just get into it? So I I, I stop putting my foot in it. We can just keep on rolling. <laughs> Go for it. So I was curious just to pick your brain, and this is quite an open-ended question to, to kickstart a podcast with, especially with the foundation that we've laid uh, about how much of a broad topic it is. But anyone coming to you and saying, all right, I'm running a marathon, like what are a few of the most important things that I should be focusing on? I know this is broad and it's very hard to be general with, with something like this. But if you could have a couple of generalities, a couple of things that really stood out to you as the, the key factors that need to be focused on to, to get to that start line confident, fit, and, and, and like with a fair amount of trust in your ability to go, like what would say three of those things be? Well, the running training is the most important. And to be able to actually achieve that, you need to address a few other things, you know, like allowing yourself to recover properly. So um, I think some of the key pillars to being able to do the running training is actually having enough sleep like getting sort of some sort of consistency and quality sleep which you know as parents it can be harder but if you are having broken sleep make sure you get to bed a little bit earlier or if you know some people can nap during the day um you know if, if that's what you have to do to get a bit of sleep in so i think um staying on top of that um, making sure you're fueling adequately just you know, during the day, getting some energy in before you run, but importantly, making sure that you're fueling, refueling after you run with some quality, you know, protein and carbs. And then, you know, appropriate footwear and um, those sorts of things are important too. So 
the running training and I think having a plan so that you don't mm. progress it too quickly. So making sure that you build up slowly um, and you're incorporating all of the essential things. So for a marathon, you do need to have long runs in there. You need to, you know, build that up progressively to, to be, I don't know, I think you can probably get away with um, – between like 32 to 35 kilometres being the longest run you get to. I don't think you have to cover the full marathon distance, but um, certainly if you have, you know, a few of those under your belt, you you know that you've got the the muscle conditioning um, required to, to complete the distance. So I guess from the aerobic point of view, if you're not able to maybe tolerate um, a lot of runs, you can also – um, complement your running training with some cross training sessions but as long as you're getting yeah some some quality long runs in and if you're aiming to do more than just complete the distance and you actually want to run a particular time I'd suggest um, getting a couple of you know interval or fartlek sessions in in as well just to work on on the pace so yeah that that's a huge part of it um, I would also say another um essential before the marathon is to actually practice your um, race day hydration and fueling so you don't want to jump into a race um, you know just thinking oh when I get to the station I'll drink whatever's there and I'll have whatever gel I can find it is it is ideal if you can practice um, you know what you're going to use on race day in training just to make sure that your stomach tolerates it you know the feeling of trying to rip a gel and gulp it down while you're running and um, drinking while you're running as well can can be tricky and quite an art so I'd say those two um, points are the main ones <laughs> yeah no that's really good hydration was something I was I was really keen to get into with you as well I think we might have we touched on it briefly because I was explaining that when I ran my I've only got one reference point as a marathon because I've only ever done one and I hate that I have to bring it up because it wasn't a good day but uh, when I ran my first marathon I, I had been doing some preparation with the, the hydration plan and getting the gels down and I'd never really used gels before so it blew my mind just how um I don't know, it was just a, it was a weird thing to try and navigate because they really made a big difference in the way that your stomach felt and it was a, quite a gluggy kind of a run if you didn't time it very well. But uh, when it comes to, to your uh, preparation with your hydration plan, like are you incorporating your, your gels or your liquids into just your, your longer slow runs or are you practicing when you're doing intervals and thresholds as well, like trying to get a bit of a feel for uh, what those gels are like at, at different paces and um, you know different fatigue levels? So for me, I mainly practice in my marathon-specific block, which lasts for 10 to 12 weeks, and it's on the Sunday long run. But as I get closer um, to the pointy end of my training, I start incorporating some race pace um, periods within my long run. So it might be the final 30 minutes of my long run is sort of at marathon pace, and that's where I can practice the gels and and the, the drinks at my actual marathon pace because I think it is important to to practice it at your marathon pace. It's quite different as you're just trotting along casually um, to when you're pushing the pace and trying to <laughs> get water in your mouth and um, it, it can be quite distracting. So uh, if you're not sort of doing any of your long runs, at your marathon pace that's where it might be wise to to give it a go um during one of your quicker spe um, sessions um, on a week night or whenever you do them yeah no that makes sense so you mentioned as well that so your your specific um i guess it's your refinement period uh when you talk about your 10 to 12 weeks leading into that marathon so that's obviously the the really pointy end of, of going into a marathon a couple of months out but in the lead up to that, you've obviously, uh, have you got like a pretty standard base of training? So you'll never not run throughout the course of a year. You'll still be running, but it might not be as intense and might not be as tailored towards that. Or in that other part of the year, are you training for like other shorter races, which are still like with a long-term vision towards a marathon? Or like, what's the difference between those two phases of training? Like the, the average training throughout the course of a week and that 12-week um, tune-up phase? Yeah, it's a tricky one as a marathon runner because the, the key marathons, um, you know, the major runs like the Berlin, New York, Tokyo Marathon, um, Boston, uh, 
even, you know, like Melbourne Marathon and whatnot, they tend to be either in that April sort of period or more September, October. So my seasons have typically been geared around peaking for a marathon, um, yeah, in the sort of April phase and then October. But on the years where I'm focusing on a major championship, say the Olympics or Commonwealth Games or World Champs, that's usually smack bang in about August. So I plan my year around my marathon races and hope to, you know, fit in a bit of a speedier phase as well. So if I can, you know, head to nationals and, and focus on a 5K or a slot in a Zatapec 10K, I think that really benefits my marathon. So I tend to keep a sort of base base going and my sessions are just geared towards whatever um, distance is coming up. So I'll generally keep, you know, a Wednesday medium long run, a, a Sunday long run and say a a key session on a Tuesday and a Friday or the Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday model, um, whichever we're going with at the time. Um, and my sessions will just be yeah, geared towards whatever distance is coming up. And yeah. actually my Sunday long run when I'm in a marathon phase is really geared towards the marathon. You know, it'll be two and a half hours versus if I was focusing on the five or 10K distance, I might only run for, you know, 90 to minutes to an hour 45 yeah sure so it's only in that that 12 week lead up that you're going to get your runs up to sort of the two and a half hour limit yeah 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 and 90 minutes in the in the rest of the year Mm. around about yeah 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 and it's it's all been so different over the last few years just with um being pregnant giving birth coming back to running but that's sort of the way it was working from you know, 2012 until 2018 at least. <laughs> yeah, gee, it's funny. Um, So just last night, my Jessie was, was talking about you because she's trying to close up. That She's got that little gap in her abs that she's still trying to close up. And yeah. uh, she's like, man, I feel competitive. Like I really need to get back in shape because I think I can't remember your story exactly, but she heard something about you where, what was it? You had a solid gap between your abs. And as a physio, I guess you know all the moves, all the tricks to bring them back together. But Jessie's like, all right, I've heard. I've only got like three more months to get them back to where they need to be. And there's still too much of a gap going on there. So um, uh, I don't know why I brought that up, but you're, you're, you've been a regular topic of conversation in this household because I think Jessie just admires the fact that you can go out and run marathons after giving birth. <laughs> yeah I mean it does come with its extra challenges like I've still got a little bit of separation there so I have to be a bit careful um, with my strength and conditioning program now because you don't want to do any exercises that accentuate that and you get that bit of doming there so there are certainly more considerations now when I'm in the gym um, compared to previously yeah 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 hey I want to get back to your the that last 30 minutes of your long run you were saying how you'll pick it up in that 10 week to 12 week period to to race pace just for that last 30 minutes what's the story there is that something that you're doing that's purely just to learn to to run at a faster pace when you're when you're feeling fatigued like is that purely a physical thing or or for you is that a little bit of a psychological thing as well just to know that you've got that ability to turn your legs over fast when you are tired oh there's definitely a mental component I mean preparing for a marathon is obviously extremely physical but very mental as well just being able to withstand you know boredom in some runs and being able to find strategies that work for you i'm actually rereading um uh oh i can't even think of the title of the book now um dina caster's um, book anyway she talks a lot about the mental side of running and the power of positive thinking and she talks about having you know your your toolbox of strategies and the same strategy won't work for every run you've got to find which strategy is going to work for you in in each particular run and I definitely can relate to that in training you know there are times when you want to stop just like there will be in a race there are times when you know, something's feeling a bit inefficient or, uh, you know, you're needing to push the pace and you're wanting to slow down. You've got to use your self-talk, your visualisation, whatever it might be to keep you going. And if you're not, you know, having the opportunity to practice that in training, well, you're not um, probably going to be able to use it as effectively in a race. So I definitely think those long runs uh, are an opportunity to fine-tune your mental strategies as much as they're conditioning your legs um improving the aerobic capacity of your you know 
lungs and heart and whatnot. So they're, they're brilliant because you can also practice the hydration and fueling strategies as we talked about. You can practice wearing your shoes. So sometimes I'll wear my joggers for the first two hours and then quickly change into my race shoes and practice wearing them at race pace. And, um, you know, that that all adds to your confidence. You don't want to be trying anything new on race day. Yeah, it's such a good point. And I've already emphasized the fact that I, can't, I don't know how to operate Instagram well enough to see all the names of the people who have answered these questions. But I've taken a, uh, I've taken some notes because I knew I would lose them. So one of the questions, and I can't remember who asked it, but one of the questions that was um, uh, requested specifically for you to answer was around shoes and the different shoes that you use for different training sessions. So how do you, like how many different shoes have you got in your wardrobe like i know you're lucky enough to be looked after by asics and maybe everyone doesn't have that that same uh opportunity just to be able to cycle through a, a you know four or five different pairs of shoes but if someone was to open up your your wardrobe and say okay these are jesse's running shoes what would they see and and you know what do you use that particular shoe for <laughs> yeah i do feel very grateful to have the support of asics and it- It's interesting over the years, I'd say it's become more and more complicated. Back when I um, first started running marathons, there were just sort of a couple of models that I'd cycle, but or have on cycle, but now there are so many, you know, new models available and I sometimes get a bit confused. I run a lot with, um, you know, most of Team Tempo um, works at either the running company or, or jog as well, so I can always ask them questions and I tend to just take their advice so um you know they'll recommend a new model that's come out and i give it a go and and if i like it i i add it to the mix but my jogging shoe just tends to be you know the the gt series or something that's you know more supportive and something that just feels comfortable it's often a bit heavier because it is more supportive and then for my tempo runs and you know those pickup runs and if i've got a sunday run where I'm not going to change into my race flats I might choose um, a bit of a lighter shoe too so something like the um, Nova Blast I really like and that's a bit of a higher pitched shoe but something that's um, that just it's still supportive but it's got a bit of go to it you feel like you can really pick up the pace in it and there are a few different models that I've used over the years for those runs. The Dyna Flight was one, um, even the, the Asics Evo Ride, uh, anything in that category that's still got some support, more support than a race flat, but you feel like you can really get going in it um, is a good choice for those runs. And then for my sessions, I go with, in more recent times, you know, the Meta Racer, there's now a high stack version of that, the, the Meta Speed. Uh, before that was available, I was wearing the um, the Tartha, edge um back in the day it was yeah sort of these race flats have evolved over the years and then if i'm on the track i'll maybe pick a different shoe again so really if if we take the track away there are three shoes that i'd like to cycle um, yeah and are you ever jumping in the spikes anymore when you get out on the track or are you always just training in your flats my um, calves would cringe at the side of my <laughs> these days. Uh, the only reason I would is because the new rule means that you can't race flats on the track anymore. So uh, if I want to race on the track anytime soon, I'll need to get used to the spikes. <laughs> oh, wow. I didn't realise that had just come. Well, I don't even know if that was new. So what, there's no more. Is that because of the next percents coming out? People have started to... To, to rock some pretty nice times in the flats or what's happened there? Yeah, so they've got um, a limit to the um, the hill, hill height uh, and it meant that a lot of the traditional race flats um, yep. have been banned if you want your time to be ratified. So people can still wear them, but their times just won't count. Yeah, okay. Now, Jess, before I move on, if you see me looking away, it's not because I'm bored with the conversation. I've got my phone just here uh, with some of the questions in front of me. But before I get to the questions, you said something before which I didn't want to forget about, um, just about the mental strategies that Dina Caster was talking about, the toolkit. I actually, I think it was episode 107 of, of Tim Ferriss's podcast that I was just listening to on the way here. Um, I don't know how I got onto it, but it was with Jocko Willing. And I'm not sure if you know him, but he's a, a, like a Navy SEAL, really highly regarded. Um, he's, 
I'm probably underselling exactly what he does, but he's he's really re- highly regarded for his uh for his his sort of mental approach to whatever it is that he does. And and Tim was sort of asking him about how he does so well in those situations. And one of the things that stood out to me is uh, he was speaking about how when he whenever he's in a high pressure situation or a painful situation, one of his uh, one of his uh, what do you say not weapons but one of his skills that he goes to his toolbox for is the ability ability just to sort of be able to separate himself emotionally and almost be able to view what he's going through as a spectator. He says, I just have that, that uh, he goes, whether it's a conversation with someone that I'm nervous about having or whether it's a like a high pressure military situation, I've always had that ability and I've trained it to be able to stand outside myself and go, okay, what's the next most effective move? Like what can I do to make this easier for myself? And I thought that's such a, an awesome strategy. But are there any real standout ones that you have? Like have you got a little bit of a toolkit that you go to um, that you might not have even been conscious of, but that you probably go to more than um, more than you might have realised and, and, until you sort of started thinking about it? Well, it's funny. So my first ever marathon was in Nagoya in early 2012. And I remember just really focusing on getting to each 5K checkpoint. I really broke it down that way. And I thought, I've just got to be efficient. I've got to get my drinks. I've got to get my gel. And... I thought of myself as just almost being a car or a vehicle or something, not not thinking too much about how I was feeling or letting any emotion in. I just wanted to think, focus on the process, um, drive the car, and then I remember at the halfway point, I started to get some um, some cramping feelings in my um, in my shin. And I thought, okay, I'm going to try and, like, use my calves more to offload that and, you know, started thinking about things from more of a physio perspective and reasoning through um, what was going wrong as the wheels were progressively falling off, how I could keep myself in one piece. And then when I saw Adam at the 34-kilometre mark and he was jumping around saying, you're on pace, you know, you're going to get this Olympic qualifier if you can keep, keep going. I, I was just suddenly became really emotional and yeah, I I was really involved in my own thoughts and I remember picturing, you know, my family and people at home maybe cheering in front of the TV and picturing going to the Olympics and I started just thinking ahead and like, if I can, you know, <laughs> stay on pace, think of yep. what's going to happen and I think that kind of carried me through to the finish line and I sort of then went into the London Olympics and it was such a different experience because I knew that, uh, you know, people knew I was out there racing in Nagoya in Japan. I'd just been, yeah, no one really in Australia other than those close to me knew that I was racing that day. And so I remember at the 13 kilometre mark, so I'd just taken my first gel and there were the cameras and just deep crowds of people screaming the whole way. There was nowhere to hide. I suddenly became really overwhelmed and sort of anxious. I suddenly thought, far out, I don't know if I'm going to finish this race. I don't know if I want to be here. I really just wanted to find somewhere, um, you know, among the crowd where I could just run off to the side and hide. I, I didn't like how on show we all were and it really scared me. I just, I panicked and almost felt, you know, when you've had too much caffeine or something and you get sort of the shakes and in that moment, I just had to get out of my head. And I remember just looking at someone in the crowd and kind of locking eyes with them and completely distracting myself from my thoughts. And that was enough to just, yeah, get snap me out of that little moment of panic. And, um, and I was able to continue racing on and it was fine. I, I finished the race and <laughs> I was happy. But a, a year or two later, I started working with a sports psychologist at the Sports Institute here. And he started talking to me about associative and dissociative thinking. It's sort of internal thinking where you've, you're thinking about your um, how you're feeling, your emotions and whatever versus, I guess, being more external, observing what's happening outside and, you know, as that navy seal sort of talked about and i realized that i'd sort of been using those strategies without knowing what they were and so then i was able to start planning my thoughts before a marathon thinking in the first half this is what i'm going to do Ah. 30 kilometers um, i'm going to let 
you know, some of the more emotional thoughts come in to, to fuel me um, to the finish line. And so I actually kind of preempt my thoughts before a race now and I might see on the course map that there's a long stretch of coast where it could be windy and really tough. And I think, okay, along that stretch, I'm going to be thinking of, you know, these people who helped me to get to the start line or these kids who sent me messages. Um, I think it's going to be, you know, a bit tougher there. So at that point, I want to maybe look at the crowd and and engage a little bit more. And um, that sort of, yeah, helped me. But typically the first half of the race, I do just take the emotion out of it a bit, be a little bit more clinical, think, just be efficient and enjoy the moment while you're feeling good. And then I let, yeah, more of the emotional thoughts creep in later in the race. Yeah, what a smart way to do it. Like if you can anticipate some of the challenges that are going to be ahead, it's not, first of all, I guess it's not so shocking when it hits you, is it? And then second of all, to to have that tool up your sleeve to go, okay, well, I know how I'm going to actually address it. That's awesome. I'd just be laughing because I reckon if I was the bloke in the audience that you locked eyes with, I would take it purely as I looked good. I'd be like, mate, hey, did you see that? Did you see? Look, she's exhausted and she still managed to get a glimpse. Look, <laughs> that bloke in Japan's going to be shattered right now to find out it was actually just a way for you to break out of the pain that you were feeling. He just happened to be there. <laughs> well, it's, yeah. I mean, that was a really long answer, but I just remember how much it scared me in that moment. I'm like, far out. I'm at the Olympics. I'm running for my country. Yeah. I'm 13 kilometres in and I, I'm freaking out. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what to do. And... Fortunately, that strategy worked for me. <laughs> it's it's really interesting that you say it because uh, I think you look at someone on TV and uh, I know whether it's a footballer or like a Dusty Martin or yourself running the Olympics, you sort of just take it for granted. You think, okay, they're an elite athlete. They know how to handle this. They've been there before. But it is interesting to hear that, you know, just like everyone else, you guys are still learning to navigate that high pressure situation it's uh it's sort of refreshing and encouraging because i think there's there's definitely going to be moments in all of our races that we're going to you know either hit a brick wall or hit a moment of doubt or uncertainty to so to hear a couple of strategies and to to hear that someone in your situation actually experiences that i think is is pretty cool it's nice to know that uh you got that in common with you know the rest of the humans who line up on a start line but jess i've got my eyes a little bit on the clock and i've found some of the questions and i've found some of the names um, so I'm going to fire some of these questions at you and you feel free. Uh, there's no such thing as too long an answer. Obviously, I want you just to, to go nuts. And if you mate, like this is my podcast and the amount of tangents, if you haven't already realized that I take, I'm sure, you know, listen to a couple of these episodes, just ha- I'm learning. Um, all right. Carly Athorn. I hope I'm saying her name right. Uh, hi, relax running. <laughs> Question for Jess Trengove. I'm 28 year old female runner who has done two half marathons and looking at doing a full marathon this year. I've been consistently training to do this goal. Uh, for new marathoners, can you please give three of your ultimate tips? I think we covered that in the first one, all right? Yeah. But at least I've given Kaylee Athorn credit for that. I only sort of gave two tips, though. So the third one is to, you know, minimise injury risk because you really you want to get to the start line feeling um, strong and, and uh, ready to go. If you're carrying a bit of a niggle, it can really play on your mind and obviously... Um, little niggles can come to the surface later in the race. So if you feel a bit vulnerable or, um, you know, on the verge of getting injured, I would also recommend just having um, a health professional on your side, someone you build a bit of a relationship with, knows your history and knows how you move. Just if anything crops up, to be able to confidently go and see them and they'll be able to, you know, look at your movement and say, or, you know, you just this is, you know, not looking quite right and um, give you some tips and, and maybe a bit of a tune-up. And, you know, it could be a, a physio, a, a podiatrist, a, you know, even some massage therapists have a really good eye for, you know, how you're moving and can can really be a valuable asset um, on your team. So I would recommend also adding a health professional who knows running into the mix as well. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Um, Lionel Worth says, do you follow any specific advice from uh, a dietitian and do you have any tips? I do. So uh, following um, 2012, I started working with Olivia Warns, who's the um, sports dietitian at SASE. So she's helped me with my day-to-day nutrition, but also um, gives me a really specific 
marathon nutrition strategy. So I do follow a bit of a carb load um, plan in the, the two days leading into a marathon. So if it's on a Sunday morning, I'll start sort of on the Thursday night, the Friday morning, uh, reducing the fibre in my diet, but upping the carbs. So the reason I reduced the fibre is because I found when I did a carb load with high fibre foods like your whole grain breads and, you know, lots of sweet potato and bananas and beans and whatever, you kind of line up on race day just feeling a bit stodgy and um, a little bit unwell, I guess, uh, by taking the fibre out, which is something I certainly wouldn't recommend um, for the long term or your daily diet, but just in the immediate lead up to the marathon, it kind of leaves you just feeling a little bit um, lighter and, and ready to go um, and can help with like, yeah, potential toileting issues if you're <laughs> smashing the fibre in the lead up to the race as well. So I've fine tuned that plan and um, feel really confident in it. So I've done, I've done 12 marathons now and um, so I've had a lot of opportunities to really refine that marathon strategy. And it's quite specific to me, you know, my weight and the foods I like to eat. So I'd recommend seeing a, a sports dietitian to, to actually get a, an individualized plan. Yeah, it's really interesting because I've heard a lot of people speak about um, fueling from high fat diets now as well. So I wasn't sure how popular that was amongst, you know, a lot of elite distance runners or whether it's something a lot of elite distance runners do or whether that gets into more the ultra marathon scene. But um, but the, that carb load really works for you specifically just going into a big run. Yeah, I think the ketosis, the, the high fat diet can be um, valuable for that really low intensity sustained um, exercise. So maybe more... Um, at times the ultra races but if you're trying to sort of um, yeah maintain a, a fast pace you really want energy that you can access really quickly so the carbs tend to be the preferred fuel source um, mm. but if you were yeah trekking across a desert or something like that it might be the high fat um, might be you know a good option because you burn through the carbs quite quickly yeah, awesome, awesome. Uh, M. Christo, I met M. Christo at the start line. She goes out, so uh, I've said it a couple of times now, Great Ocean Road Run. I was on the microphone and someone came up to me. She's like, oh, I've been trying to figure out for the last 10 minutes where I know your voice from. She's like, it's the Relaxed Running Podcast. I was like, come on, how good is that? I was like, oh, mate, like that's a bloody distinctive voice that you could pick that up. I think she was just saying you sound a bit nasally. I um, I don't know if you can tell, I'm rocking a little bit of a cold at the moment. So this whole chat, I've just heard my, my own voice. I'm like, mate, like, Go blow your nose. So I hope it hasn't been doing your head in. It will now for the last few minutes. I shouldn't have brought it up. Pretend I didn't say it, Jess. <laughs> I'm glad I brought that up at the end of the chat. Anyway, M. Christo is my new mate. She was awesome chick. She ran, I want to say she ran three hours 50. I think she did for the for the 45, 44K yeah. down there at Great Ocean Road, which was bloody solid. Like she was doing well. All right. Uh, favorite treat meal after a big race or run? Yeah. It's the same every time. I really don't feel like sugary foods after a race. I think it's just because of the, the gels and whatnot that I've consumed. So typically I want a really like salty burger with sweet potato, salty fries. Oh, sign That's me up. That's my go-to post-race meal. But, you know, depending on how crook I'm feeling, it, it might take a solid sort of five to six hours before I feel like eating that. <laughs> <laughs> um uh, what do we got here? Oh, here's a, this is a quite a broad question, but I like it. Brad Brown 96 asked, and this could come into what we were speaking about earlier, but I'm interested to hear your thoughts. Um, just quite a broad question. How do you stay focused? And I don't know whether that means as you're running or throughout your training or whatever it is that you're doing, but you can feel free to answer that um, as you understand that question. Well, I am very goal-driven, so I maintain my motivation and focus by knowing that what I'm doing or the session I'm about to do is um, moving me closer towards that goal. So I like to have my big goal, so it might be a marathon in three months' time, and then I like to have my process goals and my shorter-term goals. So for me, I'll break those process goals down into the daily habits almost, you know, around sleep and fueling and my session and and – that's how I stay focused is knowing that um, or believing in 
what I'm doing is, is taking me closer towards my goal. If I didn't have that sense that um, it was it was beneficial to me, I, I think I'd find it pretty hard to, to stay focused. Yeah, I can imagine. No, that makes a lot of sense. Um, the last question, this is the second one that my mate M sent through. She asked, do you have a particular song that keeps you pumped up? Any particular song that keeps you motivated? Oh, I've actually been listening to podcasts flat out and I haven't listened to music when I'm running um, in a very long time. So it's a good question. Um, oh, I'm a bit old school. Like I love my sort of 80s, 80s music and, and I'm, yeah, I'd say for me now it's just about when I go out to run, I flick through, I go into my podcast. Um, I've sort of got all of the podcasts that I follow and look through that scroll through the latest episodes and just look for something that is going to um, get me going that day. Some days it's a, you know, podcast about um, parenting and, you know, toddler tantrums or something. And another day it's, um, you know, something to do with running and, and just, I don't know, people who are good at whatever they do. I just love listening to, to people being interviewed and, and that really fires me up on my run. On yeah, that's good. Yeah, and I find that I find that helpful as well. I, I'm a bit of a podcast nerd. Sometimes I just like the peace and quiet and hear my own footsteps, but sometimes I'm like, oh, yeah, give me a Tim Ferriss podcast to listen to. I've been a little bit stagnant. I need to expand my podcast appreciation. It's one of those things that there's so many out there that I'm like, I don't know where to turn. <laughs> I'm not sure who to listen to. So you got any recommendations? I know you sent me one of uh, Hugh Van Seilenberg a while ago as well. Oh, the Imperfects. Yeah. He's a really good, he's had, um, they've branched out a bit now and they've got the, um, yeah, a few different kind of categories, but, but they're always fantastic. Um, even just how I built this, the um, kind of startups and yes. entrepreneurial podcasts are really cool. Uh, yeah, I could reel off um, quite a few at the moment. Relaxed runnings. Uh, I've heard it's good. I've heard it's good. I heard the host is very handsome. <laughs> Jess, that's awesome. Oi, the clock has just ticked over 45 minutes, and I know you've got to go pick up little Billy Boy, so I don't want to uh, take up too much of your time. As always, I could talk to you for another seven hours, but I uh, I know you've got a life to live outside of uh, the Relaxed Running Podcast, so I'll let you go. But oi, um, as I always say, open invite. Let's come back and do part 27 if you want. Like We'll just keep yeah. them coming. Whenever you've got a spare hour, send me a message and go, hey, Tice, let's co-host. For sure. And if anyone's got any other questions off the back of what we've talked about today, if they just send them through to you, we can just um, create a little, you know, list for next time. Uh, Jess, that is a very polite way of, you, of saying, Tyson, write them down, you dickhead. For <laughs> I know that's not what you were saying, but it's what I've taken out of it, and it's very practical, helpful advice to myself. Jess, you're a legend. Hey, thank you so much, as always, and uh, we'll, we'll chat again real soon. 